No doubt this is a familiar psalm to you if you know the scriptures well. But a powerful psalm indeed. Verse 1 says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions. My sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I will give it. You would not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. This is God's word. Everyone, whoa, let me back that up a little bit. Everyone enjoys a good story. And storytelling is really a great way to kind of connect with our world around us as well as teach powerful life lessons. And, and I especially, for me, I love songs that tell a story. When they, they set a story to music, I really enjoy those. They used to be called ballads back in the day, and, and it's actually a very ancient tradition going back through history for many, many years. Um, and, and these kind of songs might tell a happy story or a sad story or maybe a moral story or, or a love story or maybe even sometimes a funny story. But personally, I have these great memories of growing up listening to my dad play his guitar and sing songs that some of you who are younger will not recognize, but some of you who are older will. My dad would sing songs like El Paso by Marty Robbins, and I would just listen to him sing that story, and, or, or songs like Lucille by Kenny Rogers. And, and those kind of songs have a way of kind of reaching down into us, because we can identify with the characters in the story, and we can kind of feel what they feel. And and a lot of the Psalms are based on real events in the life of David. But Psalm 51 especially really tells an incredible story. The background of the Psalm is found in 1 Samuel chapter 11 and 12. It is the story of David's sin with Bathsheba, his murder of her husband Uriah, his being confronted by Nathan the prophet, And then, of course, his confession and his repentance before God. This is why it is called a penitential psalm. And it's just remarkable for its honesty. And and, and parenthetically, let me just say, when we see in the Bible that the Bible does not gloss over people's sin, but rather tells the truth about people, one of the many apologetics, um, one of the apologetic proofs for the inspiration of the Bible is the fact that it shows us the good the bad and the ugly about God's people. Other religions often make their heroes look perfect, but the Bible teaches us so clearly that the heroes of our faith were human. They were frail, 
They were sinful, just like us. And it's also a great example of just how incredibly relevant the Bible is for modern day life. We are all sinners on the same journey. And we can suffer the same failures as David did. The problems that we face in our society today are really not all that different from those that these people faced in the days of the Scripture. But ultimately, this incredible psalm and this incredible story teaches us how sinful people like us can get right with God. How we can be restored to fellowship with Him. We see this, first of all, in verses 1 through 6 in David's confession. To confess is a word that simply means to acknowledge or to agree with. The first thing that David does in this psalm is he confesses his need for God. In verses 1 and 2, he describes how horrible his sin is. He wants God to know that he is sorry about it, that he's dealing with the whole issue. He's not trying to leave any stone unturned. He, he wants God to see that he's, he knows he's sinful, and he's sorry over the depravity of his own sin. And he also knows this, that according to the Mosaic law, there was no provision made for adultery or for murder. And so because of this, David cries out for mercy, which David understood to be an essential quality of God's character. He knew that above all things, God was merciful. And so what he's saying here when he cries out for mercy, he's saying, God I need you. I can't go on without you. Now, would you agree to, with me that that's a confession that each one of us can make every single day? God, I need you, and I cannot go on without you. We sang it this morning. I need thee every hour, right? That's what David is saying. He's saying, I need God, and I need his mercy. And so after confessing that need, he really opens up, and he is honest about his sin. In verses 3 through 6. You know, the interesting thing about this psalm is David makes no excuses whatsoever for his sin. And he never places the blame on anyone else but himself. He says this. He says, I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. Again, remember, to confess means to acknowledge or to agree. And in this context, he's acknowledging his sin. He's agreeing what God has to say about sin. And so if we do not confess our sin, then we can never enjoy the freedom that comes through God's forgiveness. And David understood this. And the wording that he uses in this psalm is actually pretty fascinating. When he, said, when he uses the word to know, or that word also means acknowledge, uh, when he says he acknowledges his transgression, what that means is he's calling sin what it really is. By saying to God against you, you only have I sinned, he's not minimizing the hurt that it caused for others. David knew that his sin was devastating. It cost Uriah his life. It cost Bathsheba her husband. It cost Bathsheba and David a child. And it caused his family trouble for many, many years to come. So what David is actually saying, what he's confessing, is that while sin hurts many people, ultimately all sin is an offense against God and his holiness. And so when he says that, that God may be justified in your words, blameless in your judgment, he's saying this, the only way that I am ever going to be clean is to come clean with God. See, that's really what it means to confess. It means that we come clean before God, that we deal with our sins in the light before God. 1 John 1.7 says it this way, that if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. Or I found this verse fascinating. David's son Solomon, who, by the way, is Bathsheba's son and David's son, he wrote these words. Listen to these words. He said, whoever conceals his transgressions will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. I think maybe Solomon learned that by David's example. And so David, he did conceal his sin for a while. In fact, they, they tell us that maybe for about a year after his sin with, uh, of adultery with Bathsheba, 
it took almost a year before Nathan came and confronted him. And David would not find any peace during that time. He would not find any, any mercy or forgiveness from God until he was honest with God. And he came clean before the Lord. So he confesses in verses 1 through 6. Then in verses 7 through 12, we see David's prayer. And in this prayer, David specifically asks God to do three things. First thing he asks is that God would forgive his sin. In verses 7 through 9, David asks God to, to purge him, to wash him, to blot out his sins. And all of these terms are terms for forgiveness. In fact, the word purge is actually very interesting. It is the same root word that is used for sin in this passage. And so what this word literally means, David is saying, go ahead, de me, God. That's really what he's asking. David wanted to have his sins completely purged away. He, he did not want to retain even a stain of it. And David knew that only God could cleanse him and wash him from his sin. And I think the prophet Isaiah understood this as well because he wrote these words. He said, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. David wanted to be washed until he was as clean as that. He wanted God to wash him, to purge him. But then that term blot out that he used, that speaks of removing writing from a book. Perhaps it had to do with a legal charge. Now, there are actually ancient Bible manuscripts that are called palimpsests. They're actually pieces of papyrus, which they wrote scripture on often, or some other ancient book material. At one time, this, this material contained other words. They, they had other things written on them. And, but as that text became no longer needful, or, or as they needed to write something else on it, and because writing material was expensive back then, they couldn't just go down to Walmart and buy a package of paper. I mean, they, it was very expensive to get writing uh, material, things to write on. And so what they would do is they would take the, the, the papyrus that was written on and they would rub out the words that were written on it and they would actually take the, the, the papyrus and they would turn it a different way. And then they would write scripture on it, new words. And, and listen, as we think about blotting out David's sin, that's what David wanted. And that's what all of us so desperately need. And that is really the message of the gospel, is it not? The books of our lives have been written with many sins upon them. And, and, and it's an indictment against us. We know that we are guilty. And unless something is done about it, one day the scripture tells us that our sins will be read out against us on the last day. But here's the truth. God can and will do something about it if we will simply ask him. God, in his grace, can rub out the writing of our sins. He can turn the page sideways, if you will, and he can write over new words, words that are based on the message of his grace through Jesus Christ. He can write the word forgiven over all of our sins if we will simply turn to him in faith. So David prays and, and he asks God to forgive his sins. He also, in verses 8 and 12, asks God to restore his joy. He prays, let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. And then he prays the famous words, restore to me the joy of your salvation. Now, David didn't lose his salvation when he sinned. That is not what happened. But he did lose the joy that God gives in salvation. And so as long as he hid his sin. He lived in continual sorrow and sadness. And you know what I've learned from my own life as well as from the years I've spent in ministry? I have learned that really there is no one more miserable than a child of God who lives in disobedience to God and his law. I mean, they just are miserable. And so with David, now that David's sin was out in the open, he begged God to give him back the joy of his salvation that he'd been missing for so long. And then finally, he asked God to recreate his heart. These are the most famous verses from the psalm, verses 10 and 11. It talks about creating in me a clean heart, O oh God. In fact, he really, I don't think, as I read, as you read the scripture, it's, it's important to understand the context from which they came in and to even think about how these things would be said. I don't think as David wrote these words, he was thinking, 
all right, you know, create me a clean heart, oh God, just you know, forgive me. It's no big deal, but we should do that. I mean, I see him pouring his heart out passionately with tears and saying, create in me a clean heart, oh God. That word create is a fascinating word. It is actually the same exact Hebrew word that is used in Genesis 1-1 when the Bible says that God created the heavens and the earth. And so he's using a specific word here. David was not just asking God to um, help him to buck up under the pressure. He was not asking God to endure this until the scandal was over and maybe people forgot about what had happened. He was not even asking God simply to heal his heart. What he was asking by using this Hebrew word barah was nothing short of a miracle. What he was asking God to do is what only God can do. He was asking God to completely make him new. It's like Ezekiel wrote in Ezekiel chapter 36. He, he quoted God and God says this, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and will give you a heart of flesh. And that is what David wanted. He wanted a new beginning with God. But he knew this, that he could never manufacture it himself see here's what i think sometimes we do in our lives we try to manufacture a new heart we try and do things that hopefully can help us be better we're, we're so moralistic in the way that we think that we think if i could just do a b c and d god might be pleased with me and i might be a better person but david understood there was nothing he could do he deserved the penalty and so he says god make me new he knew that he could only have a new heart by the creative power of god making us new and that's what the gospel does i mean listen it makes us new creations in christ second corinthians five seventeen, paul said this if anyone's in christ he is what a new creation right the old has passed away behold the new has come see god is not interested so much in what we were as what we are going to be as we turn away from our sin and we follow Jesus. So through the power of the gospel, God is looking to wipe away our sin, to cleanse our consciousness, and to set us free from our sin. It's a great story. London businessman Lindsay Clegg told the story of a warehouse property that he was selling. Now, if you've ever seen an old warehouse in an old section of town, you know what happens as they sit there dormant. Vandals show up, don't they? They start to throw rocks through the windows. They start to do spray paint. Um, and that's what happened to this building. The windows were broken. They had kicked in the doors. And, and it just, there was trash strewn all over the place. People maybe had been staying there and, and doing terrible things there. And so the day came for him to show a prospective buyer this warehouse that he wanted to sell. And as he went through showing the warehouse, he reminded the man, he said, listen, I promise I'll get these windows fixed. I'll fix that door. I'll have a crew come in and repaint, and they'll pick up all the trash. We'll make it look good. And the buyer said to him, forget about the repairs. When I buy this place, I'm going to build something completely different. I don't want the building. I want the site. And listen, that really is God's message to us. Compared with all this, this recreation that God has in mind, our efforts to improve our own lives are just like this warehouse just that's going to be destroyed. They, we really can't do it. But when we become gods, when we give our lives to Christ, when he becomes our savior, God makes all things new. All he wants from us is the sight, if you will, and the permission to do what he wants to do. I know lots of people try and reform their lives. Lots of people try and if, pick themselves up by their own bootstraps, which I've never understood what in the world that means. Lots of people try to turn over a new leaf. And while that may be commendable, can I tell you this, folks? God offers us something so much better. He does not offer us simply to clean up our lives. He offers redemption. He offers a recreation of our hearts through Christ and through the gospel. All we have to do 
is give him our property and allow him to do the necessary building that he wants to do in our lives. So David says, look, God, I know I deserve punishment, but recreate my heart. And he finds forgiveness for his sins. The next thing we see is this. We see in verses 13 through 15, David makes some commitments to God. Now, please understand the, the, the progression here is important. We do not commit ourselves to God in order that somehow we might earn his forgiveness. No, we commit ourselves to love and to serve and to follow God out of gratitude for the forgiveness that we've already found in Jesus Christ. That is the natural flow of the Christian life. And for David, he makes two commitments to God out of the gratitude for the forgiveness that God had granted to him. First, he promises this, to share God's grace with others. He says in verse 13, he says, After you grant me forgiveness, God, he says, Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. See, David knew what it was to be a transgressor. He knew that word intimately. And he wanted to help others to experience the same forgiveness that he had experienced. You say, well, how in the world did David do that? Did he just say those words and not follow through? I mean, David didn't hold a class. He didn't mount a pulpit. So what did he do? You know what he did? He took his pen in hand, and he wrote this very psalm. You see, notice the, if you look at the inscription on this psalm, Psalm 51, which, by the way, are very important as you read through the psalms. The inscription of this psalm says, to the choir master. Now think about that for a minute. David allowed God to use the very gift that God had given him, the gift of music, to share the story of God's grace in his life. And so think about it. Every time this song was sung in worship, David and everyone else would be reminded of the fact that, yes, he had sinned, and he had sinned terribly, but more so, they would be reminded of the grace of and forgiveness of God that forgave what he had done. G. Campbell Morgan wrote it this way. He said, This great song, pulsating with the agony of a sin-stricken soul, helps us to understand the stupendous wonder of the everlasting mercy of our God. So he promised to share his grace with others. He also promises to praise God in front of others. Verses 14 and 15, he says, Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. And so what we have here is a record in the book of Psalms of David fulfilling this promise to praise God. Listen to what he said in Psalm 145. Listen to these incredible words. He says, the Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all of his works. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, God, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand. You satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him. But all the wicked he will destroy. And David says, my mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever. David may have been silent about his sin, but folks, he would not be silent about God's forgiveness. He would praise him. And then finally, after his confession and his prayer and his commitments, we see that David has a renewed faith. In verses 16 through 19. David learned a lot. I, I think his theology grew a lot through this ordeal. The first thing he understands is this. He really finally understood God's heart. Even though he's called a man after God's heart, it was really after this that he understood what God's heart really was. He recognized that what God really wants from us is a broken heart that is offered to him in repentance because in God's eyes, that's true sacrifice. David was wealthy enough to bring any sacrifice he wanted. There was nothing that he could not bring to the Lord. But he knew that those things alone would not please the Lord. And that even animal sacrifices alone would never wash away his sins. And he wasn't denying the importance of the sacrificial system. But what he was saying was what God is looking for is a repentant heart. And a life yielded to him. In the law, God might not have accepted broken animals as sacrifice but God will accept a broken heart from us. 
when we repent and bring it to him. So he really understood God's heart now. And secondly, he also knew that God's plan was greater than himself. See, he realized that not only did he fail as a husband and as a man and as a father, but he had failed as king over God's people. And so he very humbly asked God to restore his favor to the kingdom. In verses 18 and 19, he calls upon God to rebuild the walls of the city so that true, heartfelt, pleasing sacrifices could be made by all of God's people. I think the ESV study Bible has a great footnote here. Listen to what it says. It says, The psalm closes by enabling worshipers to see the relationship between their own spiritual health and the well-being of the whole body of God's people. That is, each member is linked to all the others in a web of relationships, and together they share the life of God as it pulses through the whole body. Thus, each member contributes to or else detracts from the health of the whole. The ideal Israel is a community of forgiven penitents, faithfully embracing God's covenant and worshiping Him according to the rites He appointed. This is the community that can bring light to the whole world. So David understood, you know what? God's plan was a lot greater than just he himself. So this incredible psalm teaches us some incredible truths. So let me mention just three application points as we close. First, anyone can get caught in sin. Let me say it again. Anyone can get caught in sin. David was a man of deep faith. David was a man of deep dedication. He had a passionate heart for God. And yet, he got caught in an awful web of sin. And folks, let me just be real straightforward. You and I are no different. Let me just say this. Better men than me have fallen. We have to be careful. We have to be humble. It's no wonder that the Apostle Paul writes these words in 1 Corinthians 10, 12. And you may know them, but it's worth repeating again. He says, therefore, let anyone who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Anyone can get caught in sin. The second application is this. God's forgiveness is available to everyone. Like David, we may someday find ourselves caught in sin. And like God did with David, God offers us his grace as well. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's a great verse. But it doesn't mean that there won't be consequences to our sin, just as there were for David. What it means is that God is willing to forgive us and to give us a fresh start by his grace and for his glory. So anyone can fall into sin. Forgiveness is available to everyone. But here's the third principle. God's forgiveness is meant to be shared. Just as David promised to share his story of grace with others, so should we. See, folks, God teaches us through the hard experiences of life. And we need to be willing to openly and honestly share those things with others. I think John Stott caught this truth so powerfully. He said this, It's quite futile saying to people, go to the cross. We've got to be able to say, come to the cross. And there are only two voices that can issue that invitation. One is the voice of the sinless Redeemer, with which we cannot speak. But listen to this. The other is the voice of a forgiven sinner who knows himself to be forgiven. And that is our part. See, folks, people don't just need to hear God's forgiveness spoken about. They need to see its power working in the life of God's people. And listen, if you're here today, and if you've never been to the cross, if you've never received Christ, then I can invite you to come to the place where our sins are forgiven, where our hearts are made new at the cross of Christ. But if you're here today and you say, well, you know what? I have received Christ. Then what invitation do you give me? 
I give you the same exact invitation. Come to the cross, the place where our sins can be forgiven and where our hearts can be made new. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for this powerful psalm. What a psalm of confession, a psalm of penitence, and yet, Lord, a psalm of forgiveness. A psalm that should cause us to rejoice and glory in your forgiveness and your grace. Lord, I pray two things today. Pray, Father, for those that are here today that have never come to the cross in faith, that have never trusted Jesus Christ personally. Lord, I pray that today you would convict their heart of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, that they would come to the cross that they would place their faith in Jesus Christ so that they would be forgiven their sins. But Lord, I also pray for your children, those of us who do know you, Lord, that when we sin, that we would know that as your word says, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and that we would run to him, that we too would run back to the cross, that we would pray like David created me, clean heart of God. Renew a right spirit within me. And that you would forgive us. And that we would be willing to share those stories of forgiveness. That we would be willing to praise you in front of all your people. And Lord, that we would follow you.